Welcome to another edition of Rebellion's Educational Series. Today we're looking at an American icon and legend, the battleship USS Missouri. We're here with our curator, uh, Megan Rathbone, who's going to talk to us and tell us all about her rich, rich history. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, thank you. This is a pleasure. Oh, no, the pleasure's all ours. So obviously she was where the Japanese declared their surrender. But, uh, you know, tell us about the beginning and the construction. So Missouri was actually started a couple years earlier in January of 1941, uh, started before the attack on Pearl Harbor, about 11 months before uh, first rivet was laid January 6th, 41. And it took about three years to build it around the clock, three years, 24 seven in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and just an absolute marvel of modern engineering. Um, she is hall number 63. So there is one more in the class after her, 64, the Wisconsin. But even though Missouri is not the last in the class, she was the last American battleship we ever completed. There was a worker strike in the Brooklyn Yard, which delayed her being finished. So she was finished after her sister, the Wisconsin. Um, and she was commissioned and, well, she was launched January 29th, 1944. And when you launch a ship, that's when you hit the champagne bottle against the bow. And the ship sponsor traditionally does that. For Missouri, that was Margaret Truman. At uh, the time, her father wasn't president yet. He was just a senator, um, but he gave a speech. She hit the champagne bottle, launched the Missouri, and then she was officially commissioned in June that year, uh, did her sea trials, and then went to the war. And yes. if I remember Truman's nephew served on the Missouri as well. He did, yes, during World War II, um, which is a fun little tidbit there. Um, he just was a regular guy on the ship, regular sailor. Um, I don't think a lot of people knew who his famous uncle was, especially later once Truman became president, but um, it's another little family connection there. Uh, Margaret Truman would also be the ship sponsor again in the 80s. Um, so. so the Iowa class battleships, tell us about them. So they're fast battleships. Um, like I said, the uh, last battleship was the Missouri. This is the last class of battleships that the US ever made. Um, there were four completed. So number one, obviously 61, the Iowa, number 62, the New Jersey, 63 Missouri, and 64 is the Wisconsin. They planned two more, but they never finished them, the Kentucky and the Illinois. Um, so they're fast battleships. They can go up to 33 knots officially, which is very fast, um, designed to keep up with aircraft carriers to screen them with all those anti-aircraft guns. Um, and they're very, very big. They're almost 900 feet long, 887 feet, three inches. And then there are 110 feet, two inches wide to squeeze through that Panama Canal, which are the, um, sorry, 108 feet, two inches wide to squeeze through the 110 foot Panama Canal. So, yeah, no, the, uh, the Panama Canal with obviously is so important for all shipbuilding, whether it be commercial, uh, you know, or for the government, you know, yeah. so the, you know, the first question I get asked by so many people is, the USS Missouri versus the battleships Bismarck and Yamato. Before we go further, I would love your public opinion on, you know, a battle royale between the three. <laughs> so it's very interesting. Um, the design is very different between all of them. Um, obviously, both were taken out before they engaged any Iowa class ship ever. Um, the Yamato is very interesting. That's got that 18 inch diameter gun. Um, the Iowa class only has the 16 inch, so it's a smaller size round that the gun fires, but the physics of it basically means that the Iowa class can get their shells up to a better speed. So with the powder charge they use, so they're more deadly when they hit. Um, and the US Navy actually did tests about this after World War II, just for curiosity, what would have happened if um, these 16 inch Iowa guns with their hulls and their armor had gone up against something like the Yamato or the Bismarck. Um, and especially with the Yamato, they found the way that the armor was made, it's a different style than the solid cast steel that you find on the Iowas. To keep it in mind, the thickest part of the armor on the ship is between 17.3 inches on the conning tower or 19 on the turret. Iowa rounds went through that Japanese ar plate armor like butter. Yeah, really? Didn't stop yeah. it at all. Oh yeah, there's um, even pictures that exist of some of those test fires, just huge holes in the armor where the round just went right through. What about the actual aiming? Was there an advantage for uh, our aiming versus the Yamato or Bismarck's aiming or do you know? Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head, to be honest. Um, we, the Iowa class use a type of mechanical computer for their aiming that is very, very effective. 
Um, it's very, very accurate. I think just more the issue just would have been really armor and how those rounds would have been able to hit and if you could hit them well. Well, speaking of mechanical, obviously the Missouri was mothballed and then it came back and it had a computerized uh, version in the 80s. So I assume it was much more accurate so they didn't actually really change the 16 inch projectiles in the 80s and how those guns fired oh, really? they, that no that stays the same for the most part um the major weapons upgrade for the iowa class in the 1980s has to do with missiles so those tomahawks those harpoons the 16 inch guns those are the same computers the only thing they kind of brought up to a modern standpoint was they added a velocimeter on because they just needed to check the velocity of the rounds because the powder and the rounds they were using are from the 1930s and 40s. It's all original. They didn't make new powder lots. They didn't make new rounds in the 80s. It's all that old stuff. So they just needed to check the accuracy. And then once they got the velocity, they dialed it in. They used those World War II era computers that are just cams, gears, and levers, and they are still incredibly effective. To put it in perspective, in the Gulf War, Missouri and her sister ship, the Wisconsin, were able to land 16 inch projectiles on moving trucks and tanks. That's wow. how incredibly accurate. And that's with those 1940s so cool. era computers. Yeah. Wow. They're that is amazing. Super cool. And you think that was designed with uh, slide rule? I would have assumed that they had attached computers in the 80s to the 16 inch guns, but of course. Oh, very it's interesting. not broke. Don't fix it. It worked so well. Um, they are incredibly accurate. You can land your projectiles, like I said, on moving tanks and trucks for, um, with your high explosive rounds, the smaller rounds they fire, huge blast radius. So you don't need to be incredibly accurate if you don't want to. And the Missouri took out the Nippon Steel Company in 1945 when it shelled Japan to be the first yes. attack after the Doolittle Raid. Mm -hmm. And that's also the first time the home islands of Japan had ever been shelled by a naval force. Okay. Um, yeah, and it was Missouri um, in a task force that did that. She also did um, something similar in Korea. She also took out a steelwork um, during the Korean War. Really? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Korea was uh, a, a really uh, almost forgotten war for today's generation, where, in fact, we lost us to so many soldiers. But um Okay. It is, and it's it's something a lot of people don't talk about, but it's actually Missouri's busiest war. It's where she does the most. Everyone knows her for World War II and then maybe the Gulf, but she does two tours in the Korean War. She fires an insane number of 16-inch projectiles. She fires um, over 7,000 16-inch projectiles just in Korea. Wow, her, her three 16-inch guns did over 7,000. Yeah, so oh, three Korea. turrets, nine wow. guns. Uh, the That's magazine. Like, I was just thinking about the numbers there. Oh. Yeah, the magazine, the three magazines only held 1,220 16 inch projectiles. So you can think about all of that. Now, that's two tours spread between 1950 and 51, and then 52 and 53, but that's still, it doesn't compare World War II, a little over 400 16 inch projectiles, the Gulf War, um, a little over 700. So you look at that 7,000 number, and that doesn't even include the five inch projectile she fired. Um, that number is much higher. It's closer to 12,000 just for Korea. Um, but yeah, she was very instrumental in that war. Um, and you got to really see a battleship doing what she does best for shore bombardment. So for the layman out there, tell us the, the basic numbers. How many crew would there be, you know? So for uh, World War II, when she was um, finally commissioned, sent out, it was about 2,700 officers and enlisted. Um, that's ballooned up from the actual design size because they had to add all of those anti-aircraft guns. We really saw what airplanes could do and the Iowas weren't originally designed to have that many guns. So they made this huge crew size. There wasn't enough beds for everybody in World War II. They did this thing called hot racking where one person slept in a bed or a rack and then they went to work and the next person slept in the same rack. Um, by Korea, crew size dropped just a little bit because they removed the 20 millimeter guns, um, just the advances in airplane technology again. Um, and then when you get to the Gulf War, the crew size drops dramatically down to about 1600. And that's the removal of all the anti-aircraft guns, the uh, quad 40s, and also four of the five inch gun mounts. So that drops the crew size down. And how thick is the armor plating, the, the defense mechanisms on this? So it, it varies. 
Um, the thickest part is on the front of the turrets where it's almost 19 inches solid. Um, it's got a two inch plate and a 17 inch like cast bit. Mm -hmm. The conning tower, which is what everyone thinks of for like a big battleship, it's that round two where everyone goes into steer and where you go into fight if you're on the bridge. That's 17.3 inches solid cast steel. It's one solid piece. Oh. Um, and there's an armored box as well that protects all of the vitals of the ship. So in that armored box, you have all of your engine rooms and your boiler rooms, medicals down there, all of that important stuff you need to keep the ship afloat. That's in a huge, huge amount of armor, so over six inches on the top, and then it tapers down the sides to protect everything. And so it's a series of watertight compartments then, so not uh, watertight doors. No, watertight doors everywhere. Um, they're watertight, firetight, airtight. Um, Excuse me, yes. With the Titanic, it was watertight compartments, and that was the mistake where the water went over. Mm -hmm. And in fact, we actually had the designer of the USS Gerald Ford on the show, uh, Captain Tal Manville, who spoke about how the Titanic taught the US Navy that watertight doors would be the solution. Uh, yes. Order. You really got to make sure you don't have those, you're not relying on that bulkhead and, no. you know, the Titanic that didn't go up high enough, but um, with Missouri, if you were to go through, um, it shocks a lot of people, I think, because they picture like an aircraft carrier where you've got some big open spaces because a battleship's big. You expect yeah. to go inside and see big spaces and there aren't any. Everything's divided up. It's compact. Um, there's watertight doors going everywhere just to make sure that's all that integrity. So if you have flooding, if you have a fire, you have an issue that you can really isolate it and help the ship fight whatever that issue is. Truly a floating castle, if you will. Oh, yes, and completely self-sufficient. Um, they can make anything they need except for ammo. There's huge machine shops on board, 25-inch lathes, all sorts of machinery parts. They can repair anything they need. There's a post office. There's two barber shops. There's um, a brig, a laundry, like anything you could need to run a city. Um, Missouri has. And can it launch planes or helicopters? So in World War II, they had seaplanes that they would launch off. Um, they would just like a little catapult launch it and then it would, the planes would come up in the water and they'd pick them up with the crane and put them back on deck. Gotcha. Um, by Korea, they would switch to helicopters. We even have pictures of them landing the helicopters in Korea on turrets one and two, which is quite neat to see. Um, and then by the 80s, um, Missouri Flight Deck could land big helicopters and would do that, but they didn't have a helicopter detachment on board. Instead, they had drones and they would actually use like the Pioneer drones to spot for their gunfire missions. And that's mainly what the seaplanes, the helicopters and the drone did. It was used for spotting for their 16 inch guns. Very interesting. Wow. Just a really fantastic stuff. So getting back to the guns, mm -hmm. how long did it take to fire? Obviously, the gun was a gigantic mechanism, multi-level you know, how, you know, 50, 60 men per gun? Uh, uh, higher than that, up, up to 110, depending wow. on your turret. Yeah, so each turret's a little different, a little different size, uh, between 77 and about 110 men per turret, average out around 94. Um, despite that size and the sheer number of people you need, a lot of those guys are moving powder bags or moving the rounds. Um, they can fire at their max efficient rate, one round every 30 seconds per gun. So that's 18 rounds a minute total if you do all three gun turrets. Sorry, 27 rounds a minute, you can math. <laughs> um, but that's very fast. So. Um, that is very fast. Yeah, so nope, I was right the first time, 18. Um, so nine times two, um, two a minute. And then you can only keep that up for a couple of minutes though, just fatigue. No, I, I love engines. I did a report in college on Fish and Fulton and their steam engines. So mm -hmm. let's talk about uh, Missouri and her engine. Was it ever upgraded in Korea or Iraq? Uh, what's nope. the history there? Nope, still the original engines. The main upgrades that you get there, there's a lot of firefighting upgrades, AFFF, uh, obvious uh, foam forming foam or um, Halon for fighting fires. Uh, the only other big upgrade to the engines you'll see mm -hmm. is the type of fuel. So they shift from that bunker C, that's what you see leaking out of the Arizona, for example, um, that really thick black oil in the 80s, they upgraded it to marine diesel. So it just burns a little cleaner, um, a little more refined, but it's a 600 pound steam plant, high temperature steam. There are um, eight boilers and um, they're in four boiler rooms or fire rooms and then four engines for four propellers or screws in the Navy. Um, and they're huge. There's five blades and four blade propellers between 17 and 18 feet. Um, so really big engines to move the ship. And, you know, so many people always wonder why a battleship would have a wooden deck. Of course, it's just, you know, flame retardant. That's 
that's it. Anything else? Or? Uh, it's also insulation. So you think the size of the ship, um, we have 53,000 square feet of teak deck. So that's a lot of wood. No. <laughs> we're actually in a project replacing most of it right now, um, just because it's aged and needs replacing. But will you be selling you, it the way the Battleship New Jersey is to raise money? So we have some stuff in our gift shop, um, but we and we do some of the things for our capital campaign, but we don't sell it in the same way that Jersey does. By the way, uh, I really encourage all of our viewers to go to the Missouri's website, which will be on our uh, website and contribute. It's a fantastic piece of American history. I loved seeing it when I went to Hawaii and I felt very inspired by it. And, you know, it's, it's really, it's a part of America that, you know, needs to be remembered. Yeah. And we're grateful for everything and, and everything we do here is just to keep the ship going for future generations, just to tell everyone about what's going on. And if you do come, if you were to come say in the next couple of months or so, you'd actually see our quarter deck that's been torn up. We're replacing that teak there. Mm -hmm. um, so you can see underneath the teak and see the steel and see all the work that we put into it. Um, but like I said, that's, that teak is for insulation. If you think 53,000 square feet of steel deck, if you took the wood off and then you sat somewhere like the South Pacific with that sun beating down on it, it is just brutally hot in the ship. So it works very well as insulation. It's two inch thick teak in the World War II areas. We're doing a one inch thick replacement with epoxy. Um, but it works as insulation. It's also not slippery. So today's ships have non-skid on them, um, that very abrasive black substance you'll see like on flight decks and things that helps things obviously not slip as the ship's wet and underway. Teak isn't slippery when it gets wet. So Missouri's got that very steep clipper bow. So it becomes very slick up there. Um, and there's also, like you said, the flame retardant aspect. Also, if you drop a, say a 16 inch projectile on it, it's not gonna spark like it does if you were to drop it on a steel deck. No, there's that famous uh, American battleship that had two nuclear weapons dropped on it before, it, you know, finally was sunk. Uh, I think yeah. they had to shell it for a few hours as well. Mm -hmm. And I think that shows, I mean, I know there was a lot of concern and, and people always wonder, you know, they brought the battleships back in the 1980s, but at this point, you know, the US and a lot of other governments have nuclear weapons. And what would that mean in terms of survivability for a ship like this in a war situation? Um, we've got our battleships that have taken multiple hits from nuclear weapons. That being said, I mean, you'd write the ship off as being radioactive, <laughs> but it might not sink. Well, I would go back to General Petraeus and his point is that you know, yes, a nuclear weapon could take out a slow moving object like a carrier or a battleship, but it can also take out New York City and Washington, yes. D.C. So why would you bother? Let's focus on the big yeah. picture here. Yeah. So on that subject, how long do you think it would take for the government to get the Missouri into battle ready formation? Oof. Um, years. Okay. Years. Um, it took two years and $475 million to modernize her from 1984 to 1986. Yep. Um, to bring her up to standard today, I imagine it would cost you billions and billions. And the other main issue, if you went that route, is the engines. They're all 1940s and older. A lot of those parts aren't made anymore. This is the problem they ran into in the 80s. The parts weren't around. They were constantly making new ones. It's of course, expensive. during the explosion in Puerto Rico, they had to go back to the original documents of Bethlehem Steel via a museum in Pennsylvania. So mm -hmm. It wasn't even around anymore. Yeah. Um, uh, okay. When they reactivated the ships, they had to reactivate gun factories just to be able to, to bring them back and run them. They brought back sailors from Korea and Vietnam just to teach people to fire the guns. And nowadays, you still have your 80s crew and your 90s crew, and they're still quite young. I mean, they're very young. I, crew members I know who are in their late 40s, 50s, but they're going to have to bring back the new people to train them to use these guns again if they were to modernize them. Well, Megan, I spoke to a number of uh, former crew members, and they all said they were inspired to serve on her, and it was really a pleasure of their life. Of course, you know, you know, they're much taller than the 1940s crew, so they all remembered bumping their heads a lot, but... Um, you know, really just an amazing piece of uh, America, really inspirational. Well, before we finish up our uh, show, do you have any parting thoughts on the Missouri that you'd like to share on Mighty Mo? Um, just that, you know, Missouri is an amazing battleship and she's wonderful to see in terms of just the sheer power and the engineering that went into building her, but she was also a home for thousands and thousands of sailors. Some spent years on her and this is a testament to war, it is a testament to peace, but it's also just a part of those lives of those sailors. And what we do here at the Missouri, what we really try to teach people is, yes, she's an instrument of war, but look at her for what she can be as a symbol of peace. 
We work very closely with Japan. We have sistership um, with several museums there where we try to tell the stories of what people went through in Japan, what they went through in the US um, in World War II. And we do our best to tell anyone who comes aboard, this is Missouri's story. This is the story of her crew. Learn from what they went through so that we never go through this again. Keep her as a memorial and we don't want to ever have to modernize her and bring her back. Well, please help tell our story by contributing to the Missouri via her site. Megan, thank you so much for your time today. This was uh, absolutely excellent. And thank you so much for having me. It was wonderful. I wish you to stay uh, safe and sound during these crazy times and have a wonderful Thursday. And the same to you. Thank you again.